This is Nick Black and I'm talking to filmmaker Penelope Spheris. So firstly, Penelope, I just want to thank you for taking time to talk to us. My pleasure, Nick. Thank you very much. I believe you were born in New Orleans and you have a very colourful background. Can you tell us a little bit about your parents firstly? Yes, my father was a Greek immigrant to the United States and he married a poor farm girl in Kansas and they had four children and he owned a carnival and we travelled all about. But I'm going to make a movie about that someday. So <laughs> instead of telling you the ending of the story, right now I'll just say that's the brief version of my background yeah raised on a carnival <laughs> were you the eldest yeah uh huh. I'm the eldest of four children we'll wait for the movie now I believe you worked your way through UCLA working odd jobs and things like that can you tell us a bit about that yes I went to school actually originally to study art and realized that it didn't quite set well with me philosophically it didn't feel quite right so I switched right over to psychobiology where I did a lot of science uh, studies. One question, Penelope, what is a psychobiology? It's the study of human behavior by way of chemical changes in the body affecting human behavior. Actually, there still is programs today. It's not that archaic. <laughs> anyway, I studied psychobiology, which is actually a good background for film because I was always interested in human behavior, and I think my interest kind of started focusing on, you know, young people and kids and trends and that sort of thing, you know. So anyway, after that, I went to school at UCLA in the film school, put myself through school while I was working at coffee shops and things. Well, back in those days, you could actually do that because it wasn't quite as expensive as it is now, you know. So I graduated from UCLA in the early 70s with a master's degree in filmmaking. And I was the only one in my family, actually, to go to college, you yeah. know. When did the Saturday Night Live hit? What happened between graduation and... I started a film company shortly after I graduated, which did films for the music industry. I called it Rock and Reel, and I actually had the first company here in Los Angeles that made uh, music videos. Back in those days, a friend of mine worked at CBS Records called me up and said, how would you like to do a music video? And I said, what in the world is that? This is like 1973 or 4. He said, well, we've just figured out we don't have to send the entire band all around the world. We could just send a little piece of film. And I said, my gosh, <laughs> what a genius idea. Anyway, that was actually the beginning of music videos, and we did them all on film back in those days. I did everything. I shot one camera, I cut them, I produced them, I directed them, and so it was a very good background for me. Were there any bands that we would know of today? No, oh, most certainly, yes. I shot quite a number of bands back then. I think maybe the was most well-known of which was Fleetwood Mac and the Doobie Brothers and <laughs> Seals and Crofts and, I mean, all sorts of old bands. Charlie Rich, I did shot David Essex. Yeah, and it was great for me, though, because I was able to buy my first house, which I was thrilled about, and raise my daughter up by working there with that company, because there was not a lot of competition around at that point. Was there any competition? Not for a couple years. For a couple years, I think I was the only one on the block shooting those music videos. You know who else I shot was the Funkadelics. Yeah, and I got film on Ry Cooter I was just looking at the other day that I shot in 1974. So music-wise, I go way, way back. As a child, were you into music as well? I think, yeah, I was very much into music all the time as a kid because I had a pretty rough upbringing. My mother was married seven times, mind you, or nine times totally. I had seven stepfathers, and we lived in trailer parks, so it was kind of rough. So, you know, I always used to listen to music as an escape, and I think it also kind of made my creative mind start going, I think. When I was in college, I'll never forget the day I put music to a piece of moving picture. It was like, okay, now my life has changed. <laughs> After the music videos, I had taken this small job to try to make some money by transcribing some tapes that were done to make a Jimi Hendrix movie. I think the movie was called Jimi Hendrix. It was made by Gary Weiss and John Head, who were best friends with Lorne Michaels. And Lorne, back in those days, I remember him sitting around our house talk about what he was going to do. That was how long ago that was. Anyway, when he did start Saturday Night Live, they all moved to New York, and they asked me if I'd like to join them. But I had a small daughter, and I wanted to stay here in Los Angeles so that I could keep her around the rest of my family. When it came up that they needed a producer, here in Los Angeles, Lauren would call me, and I did do seven. Well, I did all of Albert Brooks's shorts on Saturday Night Live, and then I went on to produce Albert's feature. That was real life, and that's a fantastic little movie, Albert Brooks's first directing. Now, how did you get into producing? Was that something that came up and you thought you'd do it, or did you want to direct it yourself? Well, back in those days, it was actually a brilliant teaming that Lauren Michaels did by putting Penelope Spheris and Albert Brooks together, because I had this tremendous technological background where I understood filmmaking from start to finish. 
Albert had this profound understanding of Hollywood because he had been raised in Beverly Hills and just knew his way around like skating on ice. He, however, had no technical background. So between the two of us, we were able to exchange that information by osmosis. And he taught me a lot about Hollywood and I taught him a lot about how to make movies. I actually, I learned more about neuroses, I think, from Albert than I, anyone, you know. <laughs> He's very neurotic, but in a funny way. It shows in his movies. I mean, I saw real life and didn't know that it was a send-up of some actual documentary and even then it was hilarious. How was producing? Was it an easy job? No, Nick, to be honest with you, I didn't enjoy producing very much, you know, because basically it's not really a creative area as much as directing and writing, let's say, you know. I mean, producing is creative to a degree. It's actually gotten to be more so than it was years ago when I first produced with Albert. But basically back then it was more about just doing the business and lining up the things that needed to be acquired for the auteur to do his work. And it was a good education, but I always wanted to direct films on Saturday Night Live, but I was never really allowed to. Back then it was really hard for, it was a boys club, and it was really hard for any other women to do any directing. But Lauren paid me back later, as you may know, because he was able to make up for that one, yeah. I want to get on to the first decline of Western civilization. How did that come about? I assume that you're interested in music. Yes, well, right around the time when we were distributing Real Life, we went to New York, Albert and I did. We were hanging around with all the big comedians and comedy people like Rob Reiner and Jim Brooks and just like endless number of people that were in the business. And one day I got a call that said, would I like to produce a film for Goldie Hawn? Private Benjamin. And I said, well, you know, I've taken an interest in this punk rock movement, and I think I'm just going to go off and direct a documentary about punk rock. And they all thought I was crazy. But all those guys from those days, like Billy Crystal and, and <laughs> Ed Weinberger, is like, she's crazy. She's going to go out to punk rock shows instead of doing this. Well, in a way, I was crazy because it probably took me 20 years longer to actually make a good living for myself. But it was a very exciting adventure. I'm very happy that I actually made that turn in that time and did the decline the first decline in 1979 it's wonderful just also for the fact that it's a, it's a historical document that, that you're the only one that caught down forever yes well thank you I appreciate that the decline is actually to this day requested around the world by various museums and educational institutions and I mean it's shown all over the world and now that there's three of them everyone's interested in playing the three together and I did the films because I just feel it's important to make a sound historical document about a particular music movement movement in time and so we've done that now with three different they're about 10 years apart but we got them <laughs> I'd like to get on to the boys next door which I saw late one night on TV it was based on a real incident you know the guys that did the original episodes of the X-Files wrote that script Glenn Morgan and James Wong I do believe that yes they did pick it out of the newspaper someplace but again that was about 17 years ago and mind you back then it was outrageous that two high school students could run around on a killing rampage and whereas today, unfortunately, it's become much more common. As time passes, one would hope that the world would become better instead of worse, but when you kind of compare these things, it doesn't look that way. Was the success of Decline Part 1, did that lead to your fiction features? Well, in fact, we had a difficult time distributing the Decline Part 1 because it's difficult today to distribute a documentary, but it was even more difficult back in those days. So having very limited release, I kept being told that it is because it was a documentary. So what I did was I wrote a fictional piece piece derived from real life, mind you, but fictional called Suburbia, and it was financed by independent guy Burt Dragon and also Roger Corman. We were able to get some better distribution for Suburbia, and then after Suburbia, I did The Boys Next Door with Sandy Howard. <laughs> I quickly want to get on to Dudes, because I know it did very well on the video, and that's where I saw it. Can you tell us a little bit about Dudes? Yes, Dudes was John Cryer and Daniel Roebuck and Flea from the Chili Peppers, and then Lee Ving from Fear. We had some great parts in there. We shot Dudes in, mostly in Arizona. Arizona, some in New Mexico. We went all around the Four Corners area of the United States to shoot it. It's a very beautiful landscape. Probably reminds you a bit of Australia, actually. And the film, unfortunately, was the last film, I think, or so that was made by this company called Vista, and their distribution arm was sort of going under. So, unfortunately, it didn't get very good distribution here. I was always very pleased, though, at how well it had done in Australia. Yeah. 
We've got taste. I do appreciate the Australian taste, yeah. yes. I want to get on to decline to the metal years. Obviously, you're a heavy metal fan as well. As I said before, I'm very much a music fan. I will say that the, mostly the reason I do the decline series is as to just do sociological document. A lady came up to me the other night. I was opening the decline three in San Diego. Little, probably 65-year-old lady, and she said, excuse me, miss, I must say, I don't know if you've thought of it or not, but you're really an anthropologist. And I said, oh, well, I think I am too. One thing I noticed about Decline 2 is a very loving portrait of the characters. Decline 3 is it's a bit of a sad story. Now, obviously, there's not that initial intention. You try and go in there as objective as possible. So how does that come about? How does Decline 3 turn into, like, you feel a lot of sympathy with these characters? Right, I understand your question. I mean, it actually just comes back to the philosophy of filmmaking. You know, you have to ask yourself as a documentarian, are you a reporter where you may have some obligation to give an objective report? Or are you a filmmaker who has the luxury of having an opinion? I like to take the stance that I'm a filmmaker who is able to impose my ideas on the material, and I say that without shame. With The Decline 3, the subject, as you know, is homeless punk rock kids. They call them gutter punks here. Some of them were thrust out of their homes as early as age 9, 10, 11, and I have a great sympathy for those kids because they really were very, very unloved. So yes, my picture, The Decline 3, does give a bit of a slant toward the sympathy for these underprivileged kids. Most of them, or nearly all of them, came from broken homes or abused. Yes, we tried to go pretty deep into what might have caused them to be out on the street. Oftentimes it's physical abuse, sexual abuse, at best just plain old neglect, which is unforgivable as well. But yeah, I mean, they've had a really, really hard time, and I think as time has gone on, since I made the first decline, domestic situations have gotten worse and worse, and I think caring for our children has just gotten worse as well in some areas. What do you think the problem is? Oh, I think the problem is that parents are not taking responsibility to take the time to devote to their children, to nurture them, to teach them love, and to teach them integrity and how really to be good human beings. And part of it is due to just laziness, I suppose, but I think a lot of it is due to the fact that they have a lot of time spent trying to just make a living now, parents do, and just by trying to provide, sometimes they neglect their kids. Also, times are tough and people are angry and they take it out on their kids, and that's unforgivable. I haven't seen this film, but it's called The Wedding Band, and, oh, I know what that is, yeah. and you acted in it. Oh my gosh, you have the most minute details of my past. Gosh, I shudder to think what else you might know. Anyway, Sorry. That's all right. No, you're quite good, Nick. That, that's all right. No, Wedding Band, I think, was a movie that was produced over at IRS World Media, which was Miles Copeland's mm -hmm. company. Yes, a guy asked, one of the directors over there asked if I'd play a small part in the film, and I played somebody's mother, I think. I think it was one of my very few acting roles I've ever done. How did you enjoy it? I must not have liked it very well, because I haven't done it since. Either that or I was very bad, and they didn't ask me back. <laughs> you never know. Was it just a day there or? Yeah, it was just an afternoon thing, very small thing. I'm not receiving any residual checks, so. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get on to Wayne's World, which was absolutely humongous box office hit. Basically, am I correct in saying, catapulted you to the top of the Hollywood tree, one of the few women up there and still up there. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, well, Wayne's World came about as my seventh feature, so it appeared that I was one of those overnight successes, mind you, but I'd been working at it for like 15 years at that point. It was my first studio picture over there at Paramount. As I said, Lauren Michaels was the producer and I think sort of remembered having promised me some directing assignments on Saturday Night Live. And then also, I think he looked at The Decline Part 2 and realized, oh, this is one of the few directors around that may know something about heavy metal music from a grassroots level. So those two elements combined was the reason I probably was given that job there at Paramount to do Wayne's World. But yeah, I mean, it made $200 million and sort of changed my career. Yes, I've become wealthy as a result of it, and I'm very grateful for that. I will say, I don't want to feel too piggish here, but let me say that I've not been able to continue to do the films I would like to have done because I'm only really offered comedies now. Here in Hollywood, they will only let you do what you've succeeded with. So that's why I took my own money that I made on these features and paid for the decline part oh, three. God. Does that mean after Wayne's World you got a lot of calls but they're all basically comedies? Yes, after Wayne's World I actually should have made a list of the number of movies I tried to do that were not along the comedy line because I think it would be astounding the number of films that I went in on, old scripts that I had already written, new pieces that I had found. I went on astounding number of meetings trying to do films other than comedies but there was absolutely no way. 
So even if I took less money, I couldn't get a job doing anything but comedy. So I said, all right, I'm going to try to beat the odds. Then they offered me $2 million to do the Beverly Hillbillies. And I said, fine, if you won't let me do the movies I want to do, then I'll just take the money. Black Sheep. Now, was that Chris Farley's last? No, he did Beverly Hills Ninja after that. And I think he also did that one, which was about the... Um, Oh, gosh, Chris, the name of that. Uh, he did another movie after Beverly Hills Ninja. And then, yes, unfortunately, he died. It's just so unfortunate. He always said that he wanted to be like John Belushi. And we always said, Chris, don't push that one. And now he did it, so. How was he on set? Was he having problems on set, or was he just A-OK? -okay? I can tell you 100% while he was filming Black Sheep, he was totally clean. And most of the time, at the end of the day, he would have to race off early to go to AA meetings. He was trying so hard and it was a struggle for him you know and then once when we finished we were out doing the ADR which is automatic dialogue replacement and he came in and he was really stoned and I thought oh my god he's going back and that was the beginning of the end it's a sad story but it's another Hollywood story isn't it John Belushi and yeah and I mean this business is really really rugged and sometimes you just think how can I make it through and Alfie do you think that your tough early life has sort of helped you in surviving Hollywood because it's probably the hardest place to survive personally and professionally. I think that's very astute observation on your part Nick. To be honest with you yes and I don't really give credit too much to that factor but it's in fact true because having seven stepfathers and having to go through traveling around as I did and having such a hard time you get to be uh, tough. You get to be able to roll with the punches. I had a carpet jerked out from under me the other day for a Warner Brothers film I was trying to do. And it happens all the time. You just have to be able to feel bad for a day and the next day you got to just keep on going and try to find the next thing you're going to do. Yeah, it's true. I just want to quickly ask you what else are you up to, Penelope? Well, I'm going to be writing a book about my life story on the carnival. It may be even more exciting toward my mother's life story than my own. I think my own life story is a different one. But I want to do a book and a movie about my mother's life on the carnival. Well, you're following in the tradition that you probably know of Todd Browning, that great Hollywood director. He was a carnival child himself. Yes, well, if I could follow in anyone's footsteps, Todd Browning would be a good one. <laughs> all right, Penelope, thank you very much for taking time to talk to us and all the best with your future projects. Thank you so much, Nick.